Results from 20 of the 21 local governments in Anambra State in Nigeria Southeast have put the All Progressives Grand Alliance candidate, Professor Charles Soludo, in the lead. But with a major local government yet to be decided, there's still so much to fight for. Now, the governorship election in Anambra State has not come without intrigues, now typical of a Nigerian election, and there are critical issues that have raised questions from members of the public. In the next two days, a winner may emerge, or a runoff may be the decider. If anything, the battle is still a mile from over. Welcome to VSA, I'm Suleiman. What has gotten every Nigerian looking to Anambra State for the conduct of the 2021 governorship election? The reactions to the polls have been mixed. The election is seen as one of the dress rehearsals for the general election in 2023, and all eyes uh, were on Nigeria's electoral umpire, the Independent National Electoral Commission, INEC. The bimodal voter accreditation system, which has been described as a technical convergence by INEC, was employed. It worked perfectly in some polling units and suffered software glitches in some others. Now, rated as a good system that helps with voter enrollment, accreditation and resource viewing, the BVAS left many asking questions. Voting processes were delayed in some areas and the usual election struggles in Nigeria were recorded. Vote buying was reported to have happened during the election, which had a very low voter turnout. Now, after results from 20 local governments were counted and collated, candidate of the All Progressives Grand Alliance, Abgar Charles Soludo, is in the lead with 43.7% of total votes cast. Now, leading the candidate of the PDP, Valentine Ozibo, by almost 40,000 votes and with Ihiala local government with 148,000 expected votes yet to be concluded there's still a lot to fight for now so far Abga has won in 18 of 20 local governments declared while the PDP and YPP have won in each now a supplementary election has been fixed for November 9 and the rerun is not out of the picture now joining me to look at uh, this is uh, Musa Rafsanjani, who's the chairman of Transition Monitoring Group. He'll be joining me later, but for now, I have uh, Dr. Emeka Mbajogo, who's a political scientist. Emeka, good to see you, and uh, thanks for your time. Well, uh, the, the, the thing here is that a lot of people thought that this was just going to be an awful election in Anambra State. Tell us all your feelings. Uh, were you disappointed or did you actually see it come the way it is coming already? Oh, thank you very much, Suleiman, for having me on your show. It's my pleasure. Um, back to your question. Of course, uh, I saw it coming. I saw it coming because, I mean, there was a build-up to this election, basically. And um, the political actors started their theatrics. And uh, it wasn't surprising to some of us especially some of us that's from Anambra State, you know. And interestingly, I'm from, I am from the contending local government, or rather the contentious local government, which is Ihab. So I have a lot of interests, you know. How be it interest for good governance and credible elections? So I saw it coming, I saw it coming. Well, it's, it's good to think that you saw this coming. And again, I think, uh, what, model lock on our side that, uh, well, uh, when we had you, we never knew that you're also from Ihiala local government. So we'll talk about that. We'll look at the demographics and we'll look at some of the key things that may sway this, uh, you know, that may decide this election. But quickly here, let's first talk about the security situation. And uh, it was one of the big, biggest worry by every Nigerian and even every uh, citizen of Anambra State, you inclusive. But uh, just a few, uh, you know, hours to that election, there was a... Uh, uh, a U-turn, and uh, all seem to be okay. But I understand that uh, today, being Monday, uh, they've gone back to the sit-at-home order. Take us through that, if uh, there's any uh, uh, sense in that. Oh, 
okay. Um, sometime four month, four weeks ago, precisely, um, the separatist group, indigenous people of Biafra, in solidarity to their their national leader, or rather their supreme leader, like they like they like to call him, um, declared a sit at home. You know, and that uh, we declare the city at home throughout Southeast. More importantly, on Mondays, you know, the city at home has obviously been characterized by widespread of violence, widespread of violence, killings, assaults. That's cut across the five Southeast states. Quite unfortunate. Um, surprisingly, I mean, I was surprised, and I'm sure a lot of keen observers were also surprised. When um, barely 48 hours to the elections, um, the same separatist group, just um, called off them by their earlier proclaimed boycott of the election. I mean, we're all surprised, basically. Because, I mean, it built up to the election as much as, as early as um, 48 hours. No, as early as uh, a week to the election. There are lots of killings. Killings that I mean, I'm sure that the whole of the, whole of the nation felt that pulse, probably negative pulse, you know. And um, when they called off the election, um, the, the boycott, we were all excited. We were all excited because it was more or less, it was more or less, it was more or less a relief. A relief to the people of Anambra particularly. The people of Anambra basically had been bedeviled by bad governance. I'm sorry to say, I'm being not partisan. I mean, I'm being a political right because I mean, I have to say the truth. Like I said earlier, I'm basically a stakeholder. Um, eight years has not been quite funny for us. Eight years has not been interesting for us, and we're just waiting. We're just waiting to be given an opportunity to go to the polls. So when the issue of the unrest started, we all were all worried, very worried, very, very worried. When miraculously, there was a U-turn from the separatist group for the eight hours to the election, and they, allow, and they lifted their, they actually lifted their boycott mm. and allowed the citizens to go and exercise their civic responsibility. Everybody was happy, Excit excitedly happy. And I must say that the spate of unrest ceased miraculously. I mean, nobody saw it coming. It ceased. And I'm sure you, you, if you had followed the elections too, that there was not one single incident of violence. There was not one single incident of killing. There was not one single incident of unrest. So that speaks, I mean, that speaks volume. So, it boils down to the fact that somehow the separatist group fell on the pulse of the people. And I mean, it became rational for once. You know? So that, I mean, that goes a long way to say that in politics, you, know, you, you can never say never, hmm. basically. So we're happy, but unfortunately our happiness was cut short when we, the people of Ihala local government, we are disenfranchised from voting. It was sad. It is sad. I mean, I don't want to speak in the, in the past. Uh, 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 I, I'll come back to you. Uh, uh, apologies. Uh, uh, stop, uh, uh, you know, uh, I hope you don't lose your train of thought. Uh, uh, I just want to bring in Musa Rafsanjani, who is the chairman of uh, TMG, the Transition Monitoring Group, uh, who's been in your state, uh, Anambra. Uh, Mr. Rafzajani, good to have you on uh, VSA here on uh, New Centre Television. Thank you for your time. And uh, quickly here, uh, this is uh, not the very first time you will be observing as well as monitoring an election. Tell us how uh, you would uh, love to rate the conduct, especially of the electoral umpire, INEC, in this election. Thank you very much. Um, Nigerians had so much expectation from INEC based on the assurances that uh, INEC has given to Nigerian people and also even the international community that it was indeed prepared to hold 
free, fair, and credible election. So Nigerians believe I make, and um, uh, surprisingly, when the election day came, uh, it was uh, um, more of like a, a ritual problem of logistics, you know, and uh, deployment problem, as well as unskilled personnel that, you know, uh, we witnessed, you know, during the Anambra election. This is not really a good reputation for INEC. This is really, you know, a breach of the trust and confidence that they have assured the Nigerians to have on its ability to uh, conduct election in Anambra without those hitches. But, you know, Nigerians have seen how so many uh, polling units, uh, there was no um, electoral official uh, present. And in some places, uh, we have also witnessed uh, malfunctioning of the machines. In some places, we have also witnessed, um, you know, a very slow, you know, operating machines. And this is not really, you know, um, it doesn't really speak well for INEC, you know, because INEC had no reason to do this ill preparation because um, it, uh, it is not lacking resources, unlike any other government agency where they will cry of lack of resources. In the case of INEC, they don't have problem of resources. So why are you providing you know, the nation with the facilities and equipment and machines that are not up to uh, the standard that we expect to operate you know, uh, at optimal level? So I think you know, uh, something needs to be done. We have advocated that uh, INEC must constitute an inquiry on or investigation committee on what happened that, you know, either the uh, ad hoc staff or the staff of INEC did not even arrive um, in time because some places they didn't come up to 11, 11, 11 30. And, um, you know, in some places it is simply a frustration by the voters. So Transition Monitoring Group and other civil society organizations have helped to mobilize uh, a number of people to come to you know, express their, you know, choice by voting their candidates. So they answer that call only for them to be frustrated and stand in a long queue from morning to evening uh, in many places without, you know, casting their vote. This is not really expected because you are just conducting election in one state. So if you are conducting election, is that the kind of um, uh, preparation you will, you know, want us to have? So... This is like um, uh, a test to see how even the 2023 general election, you know, uh, performance could be. If they are not able to manage to do election in just, you know, um, number, a number is not a big place because from one local government to another, you then spend more than, you know, um, 40 minutes to get, you know, one local government to another. Unlike in some places where, you know, you might spend up to two hours from one local government to another. But this one, they are just more of like um, within, you know, um, within, you know, um, not long distance. And you are not able to do deployment. You are not able to answer the call to come and repair the machine as the machine were not, you know, working. So we will continue to advise INEC. We are coming up with our recommendation uh, to the INEC to ensure that, uh, uh, you know, uh, they rectify some of these um, uh, logistic challenges. And uh, we are hoping that uh, they will take those advices and recommendations so that in the subsequent election, what we are going to have on Do and Ikiti, and um, you know, of course, the general election, we are hoping that INEC will fix those problems. But more importantly, they need to investigate what happened. Who was you, you, you know, no, no, no doubt, no doubt, yeah. Rafsan Jani, that uh, should be done. And I'm happy that you've been able to explain to Nigerians and Africans watching. Uh, about uh, the challenges uh, encountered by uh, some of the voters in Anambra uh, with the use of the BVAS. Uh, but again, y y you should be able to also let us in on, on that because uh, for a lot of people, it's the first time this uh, will be used by INEC. Now, they say this has been rated as a good system, especially uh, for the collation of resorts and accreditation. Uh, but you did say INEC should also work on that. Are there any reports by your team? Uh, you know, did your team receive any report or witness any issue that centers around vote buying? 
Yeah, actually, you know, one of the very disappointing things that we have seen in the Narambara election is the uh, continued vote buying uh, because all the political parties, you know, are seen, we are seen visibly, you know, trading votes, uh, some up to 4,000 Nera, some 3,000, some 2,500. Um, this is done, you know, in a very open way, and this is contrary to the electoral law. Uh, this is contrary to the annex, you know, rules and regulations, but no one, you know, has been cautioned, despite the fact that um, we know it's contrary to the uh, electoral provision. Uh, so vote buying is one of the major crises, you know, or more, one of the major problems we have in Nigeria, and it is being perpetuated also by even the government that is supposed to impose, you know, um, regulation of non, you know, uh, uh, practicing vote buying both at the state and national level. So all of them, you know, it's like the politicians, you know, they are not really interested in sanitizing electoral process. But we as citizens, we must continue to preach, we must continue to advocate, we must continue to sensitize and draw the attention of the um, voters that this is their fundamental right and they should not mortgage or sell out their rights uh, for peanuts because at the end of the day, they will, be, they will pay the consequences of their development they will pay the consequences of the kind of, uh, you know, even security, whether at local, state, and national level that we are facing. So it is important that you make yourself proud and you choose the candidate or the party that you want based on conviction, not based on just this, you know, um, uh, uh, so-called 4,000 naira or 5,000 naira or even 1,500, as the case may be. In fact, in some places, it is 500 naira. This is really insult to the democracy it's insult to the integrity of the people that you are actually doing this. Let me, let me quickly bring in uh, uh, Emeka Mbajog, who is also uh, with us here on the show. He's from Anambra State, and uh, he's also uh, someone uh, uh, who's been studying the you know, uh, dynamics of politics in the state. Uh, Emeka, help us here, listening to uh, uh, Mr. Rafsan Jani, uh, who is there with his team. Uh, the issue of the bimodal, you know, voter accreditation system, the BVAS. Um, did you or did anyone around your locality or uh, maybe around in Ihiala, local government area, also, uh, you know, encounter, uh, encountered some problems using uh, this device? A whole lot, a whole lot. Basically, a whole lot. Uh, there was widespread reports of, um, of of malfunctioning of this hybrid eyelet device, device, you know. Um, and I, I, for some of us, keen observers, we were, we were quite we were quite worried that um, if eyelet chose to use this auspicious um, this auspicious um, time to ex to to launch a product that had not been verified to me. Because from from each each polling unit, each polling unit, the 275 polling units in Ihala local government, I can assure you that 75% of these polling units uh, uh, electorates complain of malfunctioning of those beavers. I mean, when, when you have such a situation, you don't expect the election to be credible. You don't expect the election to be free and fair. I particularly, in my polling unit, the BVAT did not work. It did not work till, till about 4 p.m. And my polling unit was characterized by very old people, very old people, pensioners, old senior elder statesmen that basically had frail health. In that situation, they were depressed, they were frustrated because I mean, they just couldn't wait for the BVACs to be rectified. And I'm sure you have heard of, I mean, elderly people collapsing, collapsing, waiting to be accredited, waiting to be allowed to vote with this BVAC. So I can assure you that, yes, there was widespread malfunctioning of this BVAC, and it was quite unfortunate. Did it affect the election? Of course, yes. Was 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 it was it what it no certainly it wasn't what it wasn't what it I mean like he rightly said like Musa rightly said I had all the time 
all the time and resources mm. to put this in check. They have. Yeah, yeah, I think I think you, you uh, just the same uh, thing uh, Musa also raised. Uh, I was also going to ask. I, I think I think there's a glitch uh, uh, connecting us to Emeka at this point in time. Let's quickly go to uh, Musa, who is still there with us. Musa, quickly, um, uh, one other issue we want uh, to you know raise here has to do with security. Uh, we understand that uh, so far has been. Well, A-OK, uh, security-wise. Uh, let us in on what uh, you've been able to gather. Okay. Um, Anabara, actually, before the election, even before the election, has a tradition of uh, really some pockets of um, insecurity. Uh, then coupled with the uh, emergence of the IPOC, a complicated matter because a lot of uh, people, you know, are not really um, feeling you know, um, free to move around because of the level of insecurity, kidnapping, and what have you. So uh, as the situation becomes very tense, particularly when Namdi Kanu, you know, returned and he was um, arrested, you know, again, the security situation really becomes more mm -hmm. intense. And the couple of the fact that every Monday uh, there's this uh, imposed, you know, um, sit at home order. What many people are not happy, but they have to comply because if they don't comply, they may be molested or they can even get killed. So, but um, certainly there has been conversation pleading with so many of these uh, guys that are imposing this sit-out form and um, with the directive that they also gave that there will not be any election, people really get worried. But one thing that we know, a uh, politician will do everything possible to ensure that you do not stop them from uh, their you know, means of livelihood, which in this case is politics. So um, they must have engaged uh, this group to allow this. Secondly, also with the massive deployment of the security by the federal government, uh, it was very clear to IPOP that um, if they do anything, they may... They may succeed in disrupting the election or scaring people, but the security may also go after them because they have mobilized about 30, you know, 34, 35,000 um, policemen, which was never you know, uh, done before. And the army were also there with all sorts of tanks and the tanker and so many security personnel. So that really um, also, you know, it was really a, you know, a balance of terror, if you like. Uh, but all the same, the announcement that the IPOP made had brought a lot of relief uh, and made some people to be, you know, um, comfortable that they can actually go without, you know, uh, because apparently uh, people were even uh, are more afraid, you know, of IPOP than even the police. If it is police, probably people will not um, bother too much, but the IPOP, based on their uh, activities of compliance, um, you know, people were really scared and it was a big relief that they made that announcement. So we were able to um, get people to come out and do that. But um, again, uh, we were also happy, unlike the traditional way of doing election in Anambra, we did not record any death, we did not record any major praka or violence uh, during this election, which is really good. And that is to tell you the need to engage on dialogue, they need to, you know, um, really listen to people when they have issue. You have to listen to them. Uh, this is democracy. They have the right to table their grudges and their grievances. And you know, government should, you know, at local, state, and national level, should be able to listen to people and not to dismiss them or just to use force to say that they want to, um, uh, you know, uh, deal with them. Because doing that will not really cure the problem. But I think that with dialogue was the uh, persuadence was the also creating an enabling environment for people. Because look at the people that are involved in IPOC. You know, 95% of them, they are young people who are terribly frustrated by the Nigerian state of corruption, mismanagement, uh, at local, state, and national level. Because some of the problems are actually local level. Some of the problems are at state level. And some of the problems are at the federal level. So if we can all, at level of different types of government, be responsive or responsible, I think we will escalate the kind of tension and worry that people are having. 
uh, most people that are also into Boko Haram or into Zidua agitation, they, you, they, you, you, twenty five percent of them they are also young people. These young people have been subjected to all sorts of you know in human conditions. Many of them cannot access jobs with all their qualification. Many of them cannot get admission into you know um, school. So therefore, if you don't have you know solid money, or your parents have not solid money, or you are not a you know privileged child, you cannot even get admission. You know, the so, so these 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 are some of, so these are some the, some of the issues I'm hoping. Uh, sorry again to cut you there, uh, Musa. These are some of the issues we're hoping that uh, leaders uh, who seek election will be you know uh, seeking to end. Let me quickly bring in uh, Emeka. Emeka, you've heard. Uh, uh, Musa and he's uh, also highlight. Uh, first again, apologies. There was a glitch there. We lost you for a bit. So we'll allow you complete your train of thought. Then you can also weigh in on what Musa was talking about. Uh, we asked him the question about uh, how he would rate the security agents or agencies in the conduct of this particular election. Uh, Emeka. Yes, I mean, um, like Musa said, I think I would, I would score the security agencies a high. Because I mean, they have performed, uh, they've performed incredibly well. I mean, when you have a deployment of 35,000 uh, senior police officers in a state that basically, so as you said earlier, Alhambra basically is not a state with a large landmass. So when you have a concentration of security operatives of that magnitude in a state, as small as Anambra, security has to be effective. And true to it, the security agencies have done a good job. I mean, I must give it to them. It couldn't have been otherwise, basically. So I wasn't expecting A lot of us were not expecting it to be otherwise. Like Muslim rightly said, the indigenous people of Biafra, the IPOP guys, basically must have, I mean, be realistic to themselves. and. Um, advise themselves that I mean this is this is going to be a foolish ride if you if you insist on your boycott of the election. So back to what you back to what Mrs. said in or in support of what Mrs. said, the security operations have performed optimally very well. You must give it to them. All right, okay. Um, at this point in time, I would like to uh, allow uh, Emeka. You're still with us. We're going on a break, but we'll allow. Musa gave his closing remark because uh, Musa did uh, say he's uh, going to jump in uh, to another business with his team as they monitor that election. So, Musa, your closing statement on what you've been able to monitor and gather in Anambra before going on a break. Okay, um, we're also able to observe that um, some unpatriotic security personnel were actually demanding or asking for bribes or gratification. Um, we have also, you know, um, you know, uh, seen, you know, of course, um, the, you know, how the policies of um, money, you know, um, play around. We have also seen the policies of Catholic parties, other dominions um, within the uh, religious cycle also play out. We have also seen the, you know, um, lack of equal deployment of police in some polling units. Some places like the Solido even complained there was no one single policeman cited, even though there might be other security, you know, probably not in uniform. But for the fact that on his own ward, you know, polling unit, there was no single policeman, it doesn't speak well to also um, deployment, equal deployment of the security. And then lastly, uh, we have also seen uh, from the policy side how both the INEC, you know, official and the electorate we are all eager to see that they you know, uh, participate and conduct election that will be acceptable to the uh, majority of the people. So I think you know, um, there are positive lessons planned, and as well as there are some concerns that we need to address in order to improve on the future election in Nigeria. Well, I'd like to thank you for your time, Musa Rafzajani, who is the chairman Transition Monitoring Group. He's uh, there live with uh, others in Anambra State monitoring this election. And uh, well, he's uh, uh, taking his time to tell us uh, what uh, he's been able to gather. But we'll still have Dr. Emeka Mbajogo, who is a political scientist with us here on VSA. We'll take a moment where we'll come back. 
Rekha and I will be looking uh, more deeply about the outcome and also what uh, to expect in Ihala local government area, which is this, the local government that is up for grabs, that will be the deciding factor for this election. Join us again. Well, more than 2.5 million voters we have registered for the elections, but just above 230,000 votes we are cast. And now, low voter turnout has been an issue in successive elections in Anambra, with a progressive reduction in the number of voters during the governorship polls. Now, this election saw no names in the state's political landscape face each other, but party dominance and structures still looked to have the biggest effect on results. The popularity of candidates among the voting population was put to test and the results were a clear indication of the people's opinion about the candidates. The popularity of the smaller political parties, if uh, that will suffice, also saw different suggestions to their reality with the YPP winning a local government while the ruling party in Nigeria, the All Progressives Congress, did not. Now, candidates, parties, and the importance of structures were all on display during the election. Now, still with me here is uh, Emeka Mbajogo, who is a political scientist and also from Anambra State. Now, um, Emeka, thanks for your time again. Uh, is it safe now? Let's see if we can start looking at performance of uh, some of these uh, big parties or big names. Is it safe to say... The APC is not a, a, a popular party in, in Anambra State, or is it a question of its own candidate not being popular? Well, uh, thank you, Suleiman. Um, I think it's it's uh, the question is quite uh, self-explanatory. Um, the APC, the All Progressive Congress is not a, part, a popular party in the South East. It was in an Anambra state. Uh, and, and, and I'm sure you know the reasons are not far-fetched. The region has this belief that the government in the central, the, top, the government in power, mm. has marginalized the people of the South East, particularly the Igbos, since inception. And because of that, the average man and woman on the streets of the Southeast basically, basically do not want to hear about the All Progressive Congress. Now back to the candidates. Um, it's, it's, it's sad to say that um, the Guba candidate for this election is an unpopular candidate. That is the truth. Uh, we cannot, we cannot play dilly dally on it. Doctor Andy Uba is not a popular candidate, even in his senatorial district. Funny enough, I mean, he was a senator for six, for eight years, but he is not a popular candidate. So what you see against the ruling party is more or less a fundamental issue. It's deeply rooted. It's more cultural, it's more, there's a lot of cultural and religious sentiment against the ruling party in Anambra State. And that's the, and that's the basic truth. You know, you, you know if, if politics continue, you know, if, continue, if politics is being played the way it's being played in Nigeria, will there ever be a, a time where smaller political patterns will grow uh, to that you know, enviable pedestal with big 
uh, names and big wins? Well, sadly, both of us know Suleiman that it's more or less a mirage. It's wishful thinking in Nigeria. We, are, we, we, we still run a system of, of a system of politics that is party based, not individual based, not individual merit based, but party based. So in other words, and that is why you see, I mean, I'm sure you saw a litany of smaller parties with me too, no impact on this election. Ironically, these smaller parties had very credible and very, very credible candidates. Candidates that would stand their own in any election in the South. Coast. I'm not even, I'm not, I'm, 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 I mean, I'm, I'm not even localizing it this time. I'm going regional. But these candidates have failed to make an, in, an impact on the, on, the, on the political sphere, on the political arena. And that is basically due to the politics we play in Nigeria, which is party politics, not individual politics, not independent candidate politics. And it's sad. I mean, for us to get it right in this country, we must transcend, we must get to the point in politics where we vote individuals who, rather than voting political parties. Because I mean, the political parties have failed us. They're all the same. This country is run by two predominant political parties that have interwoven members. I mean, you have a member in PDP, and the next minute is in APC. And then the it's 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 a vicious circle, and we 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 the public we can't do anything about it. Basically, because we still run party politics, we still run party kind of politics. So I mean, like you rightly said, we must get to the point where we will now start running independent candidate politics, independent credible candidate politics. And until then, we just have to pray that we'll get to that point. We just have to hope and wish that our political structure, our political character, our, politi our politics would mature to that point. Before Nigerians get to, you know, the, to the prayer point, start hoping, let's get back home and uh, right in your backyard, Ihara, local government, now, let's start talking about that. It, it, this holds a significant part of the election, and with it, there should be a better voter turnout. Let us in on what we're likely to see on November 9. Well, the truth is that um, he had a local government is quite special. I like to call it the panel of Alhambra state politics because it's, 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 it's basically a very peculiar local government. It, uh, like you, I'm sure you know that... Uh, uh, it, it almost has the highest number of registered voters. I mean, uh, it has polling, polling units of about 275. The world is about 20. That gives you an idea of how, uh, how I mean, widespread the local government is. You know, and uh, we, I mean, we, we, we that are from the local government, we don't expect anything different, basically. We will certainly come out like we did on Saturday, but I mean, we don't expect anything, basically, because I mean, a lot of us came out. I let the uh, the the bimodal, uh, I let the bimodal machine couldn't function. A lot of us came out. There were no I let staff. There are no I let ad hoc staff. There was not security. So I mean, we 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 feel very very disenfranchised. That's the truth. Because, I mean, we came to exercise our civic rights. We came to exercise our civic responsibilities. And we were not allowed to do that. And it's sad because, Suleiman, it's sad because Bihala has been it's very strategic in the scheme of things in Anambra State. Because the local government has produced very credible, very, 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 very credible sons and daughters that have contributed in no small way to the gross demos to the GDP of Anambra, these these very illustrious sons have been involved in community community projects, community projects that basically have impacted positively on the lives of people. 
and imagine a situation in which these renowned Anambra, Anambra sons and daughters are being disenfranchised. It's, I mean, it's sad. I can, I can start from the beginning of the local government, from Uli. Uli boasts of Dr. ABC Ojiako of the surplus fame. Down to Okija, boasts of Dr. Ernest Azudialo of the next oil fame. These illustrious sons continuously, persistently engage in community development that basically has increased the GDP of Anambra State. And yet and behold, key, key, um, 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 kinsmen of these illustrious sons cannot exercise their franchise. It's sad. It's sad. We are hopeful. We are hopeful that by tomorrow, we'll go back to the vote and they will be allowed to vote. But mark my words, there's a whole lot of conspiracy against the local government. And we are sad to say that we deserve better. We are sad to say that we have contributed in no small means to Anambra State as a whole, and we deserve a better deal. We have well, pension well, well, no, no, no doubt, uh, Emeka, it will seem as if uh, what you just uh, highlighted uh, has also been taken notice of by uh, the electoral umpire, INEC, and that is why this election uh, is being, you know, uh, redone again. Uh, yes, and uh, but you know, there's another point here, and it has to do with Anambra. And I was wondering, and it has to do with voter apathy. If you look at the trend, you know, in every election, uh, just I, I think it's all there's always that pattern where you you get less and less people coming out to vote. And just when we thought that the security situation was going to push more people out uh, for this particular election. The story was uh, different. So, so uh, how how has it been that a, a state as enlightened uh, as Anambra would have, you know, uh, the issue of voter apathy uh, that is almost a perennial uh, problem in every election? Well, I mean, it's it's an iron basically because, like you said, a state like Anambra having voter apathy. It's basically an irony. But I want to point out that it's never been this bad since 2016, when the separatist group came on board and basically changed the local, changed the local narrative amongst the young people. Prior to now, uh, there, of course there was voter apathy, but it was not as much as this. Now, Post 20, 2016, the last election, 2017 election, and this election, it has greatly, greatly been influenced by the position of the indigenous people of Biafra. This, this, this group has infused disenchantment and apathy amongst the voting population. I want to take you up on the demographic and the characteristic of the voting population of Nanambra. I want to take you up on it. It's quite interesting, and uh, I stand to be corrected. Now, in Anambra State, the voting population, the age of the voting population ranges from 45 to practically 40, 80, 85. Why is that? This population of people are predominantly civil servants and pensioners. This, 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 this category, this age category, are basically civil servants and pensioners. The younger age bracket are basically the traders, the peasant traders, the commercial traders that are sympathetic to the IPOP cost. And because of that, have vowed not to be part of the Nigerian project. So we are left with an age, a voting age group of 45 to 85, 90. Now, funny and interestingly, this age group, this age group have determined the, the, the way elections swing, the position and the direction of election swing in Anambra 
in the past eight years. How be it? We have not been able to produce above 55% of registered voters. We must point that out. We have not been able to produce that in the, in the past eight years. Because we are left with a voting population that keeps on dwindling because of the age constraints. That's, that's, that's sadly the situation we have in our state. So, so, so uh, how can this be? How can this be reversed? Because that's a huge, uh, a huge population that is almost uh, disenfranchised voluntarily you know, uh, by, you know, yeah, by, by, by their own ideology that they now hold. And if this continues uh, over a, a period, it will definitely impact on governance level in Anambra State. Exactly. Well, I think, um, first of all, we're looking at reversing the trend. It has to come from the central. It's like you said, it's more or less an ideology. It's, it's an ideological movement. It has to come from the center. There must be an inclusive government from the center, from the federal government, irrespective of the party in power. Basically, we must, we must tell ourselves the truth. This disenchanted group of people, this age group that, is, that doesn't want to get involved in the Nigerian project, feel marginalized feel not carried along. So we must get development to the grassroots, especially in the Southeast, and carry these young people along. That's the truth, it's the basic truth. Then after doing that, we, must, we cannot talk of more public enlightenment. Well, you cannot, you won't have effective public enlightenment if the root cause is not being dealt with. And what is the root cause? The root cause is marginalization. The root cause is lack of social amenities. The root cause is poverty. And until we solve this, these perennial problems in the Southeast, particularly in Anambra State, we're not going to make a headway on voter apathy. Very, very quickly, sorry, yeah, sorry. yeah, yeah, very quickly, I think that, that those are fine points. But quickly here, uh, Emeka, um, you know, some of the key things about governance or development in states, uh, you know, rest with the state, not even the government at the center. So this is not even with the federal government. Uh, there are key things, even uh, as uh, important as security, a lot of people still don't know that it still rests with the states. As, issue, uh, as an issue as kidnapping uh, is still with, with the state. Uh, road construction, you know, and so many other things rest with the state. So. How much of uh, state involvement uh, do the people see? Perhaps uh, maybe this can also be a thing that will uh, form the uh, you know, 2023 general elections uh, that will be coming uh, after your election. Well, sadly, sadly, I must say, like I said earlier in my intro on, the, on, your, on, on tonight, we in Anambra have been bedeviled by bad governments. Uh, this is me being not partisan. That's the truth. We have had a government that has been very unresponsive. We've had a government that has been very lackadaisical with the basic amenities to its people. We have had a government that has been quite irresponsible. I'm sorry to say. Well, I mean, this is for want of a better word to describe the activities of this government. This government, I mean, with, with this government, security has deteriorated to its lowest air. With this government... We're just trying to highlight uh, some of the key things uh, about uh, Anambra State and uh, uh, the local politics and uh, our political scientist, who is also an indigent of the state in and of Anambra, uh, in Mekam Bajogo, he's uh, been able to let us in on uh, some uh, of the key issues. He's also from Ihiala local government. That's the uh, key local government. I will be going to the polls uh, again tomorrow, November 9, uh, as in the Independent National Electoral Commission holds uh, that supplementary election. That will define who the winner ultimately 
will be in that election. And I see Emeka is back. Emeka, again, apologies. There was a glitch there. I'll let you wrap up on this. Then quickly, let's uh, close on this uh, now uh, as we're closing. Um, uh, you know, your state, Anambra, is already uh, there in the news. And it's been able to prove to the world, Nigerians, uh, that they can have a peaceful election devoid of violence. Uh, what are the examples, uh, are there key takeaways uh, for the entire, you know, Nigerian state uh, to take from this election that will inform us of, uh, you know, getting a better, a, a better, a better 2023 election? Well, of course, um, the takeaway from Anambra election is that it's basically the result of a determined people. The people of Anambra, India Anambra, have yearned to be given an opportunity to exercise their civic responsibility. They have yearned for eight years. And you have seen the resolve of the people change the narrative at the dying minute. So for me, the take home is the effectiveness of the resolution of determined group of people to effect change. Mm. And once a group of people resolve to effect change, I can assure you that change will be inevitable. So that for me, that's the take home. That's basically the take home. And the fact that our security agencies can work when they want, when they want to work, when they are motivated to work, when, it is, when the onus rests on them and they decide to work. Nigeria can have free, fair, credible elections, and we can have a secured environment to run our elections if we choose to do so. That is my take home. Well, that's a fine place for us to leave it. Uh, thank you very much for being such a nice company, Emeka Mbajogu. We do hope that uh, at, when it's all done and dusted, we'll have you again here on the program. Many thanks again. And uh, to our viewers across the continent, thanks for watching. I'm Sulaiman. I'll see you again.